welcome to the video version of the review session. We're focusing on spice themes and going in order by units. So for the first unit, that goes up to 600 BCE. And before the civilizations, we have two basic time periods, the Paleolithic era. Remember, that's the hunter-gatherers, and we think that their social hierarchies were non-existent, essentially, that everyone had an equal role and there was no patriarchy or any sort of hierarchy, and that politically they were organized by kinship groups, meaning they were related to each other. And then during this era, the Neolithic time is the development of agriculture, which led to the development of the first civilizations, which you might remember was here in what we call the Fertile Crescent, which became Mesopotamia. And remember that agriculture, as shown on this map, spread throughout Eurasia, and that it was also developed independently, as you can see here on the places in the map that are not connected by arrows, in various places around the world and that agriculture was the development of civilization because it created a surplus of food and freed people up to have the jobs that are necessary for civilization, such as reading and writing, political jobs, rulers, military, those sorts of things. But our big focus for this unit was on the first six civilizations. This was chapter three in your textbook. And socially, we have the beginnings of social classes, that once you have a surplus of food, you get elite classes developing for economic reasons, and then at the same time patriarchy develops. And as we'll see, that'll be a continuity throughout most of world history. Politically, we have the ways that states established authority, and these are pretty common to most of the states. So we're moving away from the kinship groups, and a big question is essentially why should I listen to you, to the ruler? So the divine authority is an idea that says you should listen to me because the gods have chosen me, or in some cases, like the pharaoh in Egypt, I am a god. There's also legal codes created to enforce the authority of the ruler, monumental architecture like those Olmec heads, for instance, and a lot of cases the rulers reinforce the status of the elite class as a way of supporting and reinforcing their own power. I want to show you here that, and you can access this, these slides on Canvas, that each of them has a link to the timeline here. And if I click on that, it takes me over here to a timeline that I've made for you that is organized by region across the side and by date down the middle here. And it has the note card terms that go with each of the civilizations. So you can always flip over to this and use it to help you with your reviewing. And these blue links here take you to the chapter videos I made in which each of those civilizations is discussed. Okay, and then remember, alongside these more agricultural societies, we have the development of pastoralism. And here's this map to remind you of where those first six civilizations were. The big environmental trend is these tools like irrigation and the hoe that helped to facilitate agriculture. And in some cases, agriculture had negative effects on the environment that affected societies, such as oversalinization of the land due to irrigating with seawater. Culturally, we have polytheistic religions, ancestor worship, and the focus on nature spirits, uh, which is called animism, and the shamans would be the priests who could communicate with those spirits. So again, in this era, none of our major world religions have developed yet. And there is some trade, despite the fact that those first six civilizations were primarily separate from each other. There's a couple of examples here between Egypt and Nubia. Here's the Egyptian civilization, and then Nubia is down here. That's trade along the Nile River. And then in Mesopotamia, shown here, they also traded with the Indus River Valley, which goes down, which would be in what is now India, kind of off the bottom right corner of the map here. So in my review session, I'm having people discuss these things. But the idea, this is a good place for you to stop, look over the slides and whatever notes you've taken, and identify continuities and changes for this unit. Those may need to be separated by spice themes. So you're not going to have one continuity for the entire unit. You might have a social continuity and an economic change or something like that. At the end of each of these units, I'll flip past this direction and then I'll show you some ideas of continuities and changes. They're not the only right answer, but they're things that could come out of that analysis. So for this unit one, we have a social continuity of these economic hierarchies. 
and polytheistic religion. And then an economic change in how people gathered food and how they lived from hunter-gatherer to agricultural-based societies. And then those first six civilizations as being a new political force in the world. So now Unit 2, also called the Classical Area, covers these dates. And we have a continuing of patriarchy. And Confucianism is an example of that, remember, in the, especially in the Han Dynasty. The empires, so now we're talking about larger civilizations that are formed by conquest. These empires rely on those same elites to reinforce their power. And for a social structure, we have uh, slavery, which is especially significant in Rome. Remember that slavery is not equally significant in all of these empires. Politically, we're looking at the classical empires, and these are some common ways that these empires established authority. More and more complex legal systems, especially in, in Rome. More complex bureaucracies, like uh, in the Han Dynasty. And remember, the examination system helps to select these bureaucratic officials. Remember, a bureaucracy is a way of organizing a complex and large government into departments, essentially. The military, which is, of course, going to form the empires, because these empires are formed by conquest, and also to defend its borders. And then we have the centralizing of power in one place, typically in the hands of an emperor in these empires, which is going to help to reinforce and run that empire. So these are the main states and empires in this unit, and not all of them are empires. We have a lot of empires, but we'll talk in a minute about Greek colonization and some of these city-states in Mesoamerica as not actually being empires. So we'll just look at some maps of them. The Persian Empire is the oldest and the biggest. Here we have the Qin, which, remember, was very short-lived, and then the Han, which lasted about 400 years in China. In India, remember, these empires, the Mauryan and Gupta, were also fairly short-lived. So for Greek colonization, when we look up here at these Greek city-states, that's the key phrase there is the city-states. So our book, you know, in our studies, we spent the most time, for instance, talking about Athens and about Sparta, and those are separate states that you know sometimes didn't even get along very well. And there is not a Greek empire. There's Greek civilization but not a Greek empire. When Alexander the Great, who was Macedonian, is going to come along and conquer the Persian Empire, make it all the way here to the Indus River Valley, sometimes that's called the Hellenistic Empire, but it's not necessarily a Greek empire because it falls apart after he died. And then we have the Roman Empire, of course, in the Mediterranean. So over in Mesoamerica, Teotihuacan was an important trading city. It's not necessarily an empire. And then here is the Maya civilization that developed during this time period. Then we have Moche down in South America in the Andes River region. Sorry, the Andes Mountain region. And that is the precursor for much later of the Incas. So now for environmental trends, we have technology. The big story is the beginnings of interregional trade and technologies like the camel saddle and that would be of course for the Silk Roads and Trans-Saharan trade networks and then the Latin sail and the Dow and the monsoon winds facilitate trade along the Indian Ocean as shown in this map. Those are the big stories in making that trade happen just from a practical standpoint. And then we have the beginnings of these trade interactions spreading epidemic disease and there were outbreaks of the plague in the Roman Empire and in China during the classical era this is not the Black Death, which was much later and more devastating, but it does remind us that these outbreaks of disease did pop up fairly frequently throughout world history. So for culture, we have the major world religions, and I've got them sorted into polytheistic and monotheistic. So in India, we have Hinduism and Buddhism. Eventually, Buddhism is going to treat Buddha as a god and take on more of the character of a monotheistic religion, but it's never a religion that says you know, there is only one God. And then the religious traditions in China are polytheistic. And during this era, we have Zoroastrianism in Persia and Judaism and Christianity as the first monotheistic religions. And here on this screen, we've got pretty much the major world religions in this day, with the exception of Islam, which is going to come along after 600 in our next unit. And then as a reminder, there are significant cultural traditions in China that are not technically religions, but are often described as such, Confucianism and Taoism. So we have these trade networks developing during this time period. So here's the Silk Roads here, 
Trans-Saharan here, those are the ones that rely on the camel saddle and the caravans, and then the Indian Ocean here. These networks develop over centuries, so we're going to talk about them in the next unit as well, but they are developing and growing during this time period. So now's the time to stop and look at continuities and changes. And here are some examples. We've got, again, a strong continuity of patriarchy and the economic elites holding power. And for culture, we're going to talk about the fact that in Africa and the Americas, where these major world religions that I put over here have not spread to yet, we have a, continu a continuity of nature and ancestor worship. And then in addition for changes to that cultural change, we have the development of these new trade networks, and the development of major empires such as Rome and the Han Dynasty as a political change. So our third unit covers roughly 600 to 1450. And again, patriarchy is a continuity during this time period. So we're going to talk about empires It's sort of two types. We reconstituted empires. The idea here is that they are new versions of former empires. So after the Roman Empire falls, the Byzantine Empire is a new version of a Christian empire in Europe, even though it's shifted more to the east, and has a slightly different form of Christianity, which we'll talk about in a bit. And then following the collapse of the Han Dynasty, and remember, there's over 300-year period of no dynasty, we have the Sui, Tong, and Song dynasties continuing that tradition of centralized authority and dynasty in China. So here is the Byzantine Empire. Justinian, remember, was an emperor who attempted to reconquer the Roman Empire, and he succeeded to the extent that the stuff here that is in this uh, diagonal lines, he did conquer, but he did not hold on to it. And this solid line here is about as far as the to the west as the Byzantine Empire is going to get. And then over here we have the Chinese dynasties. So we also have new empires formed during this time period. After the development of Islam, we have the Caliphates and also the Delhi Sultanate, which remembers in India. Muslim Iberia refers to Muslim or Islamic rule in Spain. We have the Mongol Khanates, which split up in the form of Persia, Russia, and China after the death of Chinggis Khan. We also have some important city-states. Venice was an important city-state along in the Mediterranean for Mediterranean trade, and the Swahili city-states along the Indian Ocean in East Africa and Malacca and Southeast Asia were also important for maritime trade. And then down in the Americas, we have these states, the Maya, Aztec, and Inca, developing during this time period. And so here's our maps. This map shows the spread of the Islamic world. This map shows the Khanates. And then here we have the Maya civilization, which and then is the Aztec in this area. And then here's the Incas down here. For the environment, the technology is going to continue to facilitate trade. And in this unit, we have the compass, the astrolabe, and ships like the caravel, which was developed by the Portuguese. Remember, during this era, the Portuguese, at kind of at the end of our time period here, are going to make their way down the west coast of Africa, all the way around to the Indian Ocean. Also, environmental significance is new food sources, like champa rice, which came from Vietnam to China. And now we have the Black Death, which is what this map shows, these orange outbreaks of the plague, and that was because of these trade connections shown in these green circles. For culture, a big theme with trade is that it facilitates the diffusion of culture. So remember from the Bantu migration and the movement of Turkic and Arabic peoples, we have the spread of language. And then the religion of Islam is going to spread along the Indian Ocean and to West Africa along the Trans-Saharan trade, particularly due to trade. And then What's going to happen for Europe is the science and philosophy from the Greek and Roman cultures that was lost after the collapse of the Roman Empire is going to make its way back to Europe through Muslim rule of Spain. And technologies that did not originate in Europe, like printing and gunpowder, are going to first make their way from East Asia to Islamic empires and then to Western Europe. And that partly happens through trade connections and partly through the Crusades. So one of the features of, the, of this unit is the importance of these trading cities, some of which we talked about more than others, but there's some examples here of cities along these trade networks. And again, cities are important for economic reasons because they organize uh, the trade. 
and they also end up being centers of this cultural diffusion we've been talking about. So we have new forms of labor during this time period, like serfdom, which is a part of feudalism in Europe and Japan, and then the Mita in the Inca Empire, which is a sort of a labor tax. And then we have examples of states facilitating trade in China, the Byzantine Empire, the Islamic Caliphates, and the Mongols, all of whom were encouraging trade largely for the purpose of tax revenue. So some possible continuities and changes. Again, we're going to have patriarchy and economic elites as social continuities. These reconstituted empires we could consider as continuities because the continuity would be a Christian empire in Europe or a dynasty in China, and the name would be different, but it is a can be considered a continuity. And then religion is going to be diffused during this entire time period. We have one new religion, that's Islam. We have the development of these trade networks, and that could be a change, or you could say it's a continuity because they started back in the previous unit. And then we have the brand new empires as a political change, like the Mongols and Islamic Caliphates. Now for unit four, which covers roughly 1450 to 1750, the Columbian exchange is gonna happen during this time period. So we have a new social class that's based on ethnic nature, such as the mestizo, mulatto, and creole. And I have the same continuities for social classes. So empires expanded during this time period. And there's lots of examples on the screen here. So we've got the expansion of the Russian state. And remember, that's happening because of the fur trade, right? People look at Siberia and think, why did the Russians want to control all that? It's because during the 14, 15, 1600s, there was a lot of money to be made in the fur trade. We have the expansion of China, shown here. We have the expansion of the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East, shown here. We have the expansion of the Mughal Empire, all the way to most of India. And then this map shows the Portuguese and other Europeans beginning to have some control in Europe. So that's why we think about expanding empires. And then over in the Americas, we've got European empires due to European colonization. So the Columbian Exchange would be the big environmental stories. We've got food going in both directions, as shown on the graph here, and also animals. And then, of course, disease. That's kind of a one-direction thing that, if you look here on this map, there's a list of diseases. Smallpox was the most devastating. But remember that due to the lack of domesticated animals in the Americas, there was very little exposure to those diseases, and that's why they were so devastating. During this time period, largely because of those expanding empires, we have the spread of major religions. So Islam is going to spread more deeply through Asia and into Africa, particularly West Africa. Christianity is going to spread to the Americas, and Christianity during this time period back in Europe is also transformed due to the Protestant Reformation and Martin Luther. And then we have the spread of Buddhism in Asia, as shown down here on this map. And part of the phenomenon of those religions spreading is the development of syncretic religions. And syncretism is a good word to know. It means that when a religion, let's say, it's usually used for religion, when a religion spreads, like Christianity to the Americas, it sometimes can blend with a, a local religion and create something new. So when there are, one of the reasons that in Latin America saints are so important in the Catholic faith is that it was a kind of a syncretic way to adopt Christianity and maintain a focus on their, the idea of there being a God for different things, like a God of, that you could pray to for the crops, for instance. And then we have Sikhism as an example of syncretism between Islam and Hinduism, and that's in India. So now we were, we were in previous units talking about transregional trade, and now we're talking about transoceanic trade and this idea that due to new technologies, especially navigation and larger ships, that they're now trading across oceans. And we have the global silver trade. That's shown in these red arrows here. We have the Atlantic slave trade and what's sometimes called the Atlantic system, the Columbian Exchange. And then again, here's these European trading post empires in Asia. And also during this time period, we have a revival of slavery 
not a, a revival meaning it ever went away, but I guess an increasing importance of slavery. And then after, as slavery starts to phase out, we have indentured servitude where a laborer is working off a debt. So some possible continuities and changes would be patriarchy and economic elites holding power. The trans-regional trade is going to continue for an economic continuity. The diffusion of religion. And then for a social change, those new race-based hierarchies, the European empires and the Americas and Asia, and then all those environmental changes caused by the Columbian Exchange. So Unit 5 covered about 1750 to 1900. One thing that happens during this time period is there are new social classes due to industrialization. So the middle class is going to become a reality because industrialization makes goods more, more inexpensive and so people can afford more. And then the proletariat is the Marxist term for the laboring classes in an industrial economy. We also have the Enlightenment, which is going to challenge some of those hierarchies and lead to efforts to change or abolish them. So the anti-slavery or abolitionist movement, feminism, and expanding suffrage, which means the right to vote. Politically, we have revolutions inspired by the Enlightenment movement. So uh, those are called the Atlantic revolutions, so the American, French, Haitian, and Spanish-American. But at the same time, we have empires, uh, primarily Europe, but some uh, Japan a little bit, forming because of um, imperialism. So this map here shows European imperialism in Africa. And then up here we have European and Japanese imperialism in Asia. And then another type of expansion is a settler colony, such as the British colonizing Australia. And at the same time, there were rebellions that challenged those empires, such as the Boxer Rebellion and the Indian Revolt of 1857, which, while not successful, are a reminder that there was resistance to imperialism. So with industrialization, we have the environmental causes and effects. So the presence and use of fossil fuels, first it was coal and then oil, was kind of the driving force, certainly for providing energy for the factories for in the industrial era. And then we have an uh, increase of food production, which is going to fuel population growth. And new forms of transportation, originally the railroad, but then especially the steamship, are going to facilitate migration, which often happens for labor reasons. So the Enlightenment has an impact on people's thoughts on the role of religion in, in public life, particularly politically. We have imperialism spreading religion, so Christianity spreads more rapidly to Africa and Asia because of European control of those places. And then in places like the Islamic world, in China, in the Ottoman Empire, we have reactions to the spread of Western culture which in many cases has to do with a kind of a getting back to basics fundamentalism um, of the culture in the home country. So economically we have some major effects of industrialization. It's one of the, it's really the second most significant economic trend in all of world history. The first one being the development of agriculture. And industrialization is really a game changer in terms of how people lived and worked. So we have the factory system in which instead of doing a variety of jobs, a factory worker did one job repetitively and was paid for it. We have the development of export economies, especially in those imperial colonies in Africa and Asia that are solely designed to supply resources for those factories. We have imperialism inspired by a desire for new markets. And we have capitalism as the main economic system that's driving this process, which again is a focus on competition and as little government intervention as possible. And that system, as it rolls out, especially in the beginning, typically has winners and losers. And so workers often challenge that system in a variety of ways. Labor unions, socialism, and Marxism, that list is kind of an increasing radicalness or increasing distance away from the original ideas of capitalism. And capitalism, as I said, is kind of a non-government-influenced economic system but in some cases, like Russia, China, and Japan, industrialization was more sponsored by the state instead of private individuals. And so we would still consider that to be capitalism, but it's a reminder that it doesn't have to be only individual people trying to make millions of dollars that can drive industrialization. 
Patriarchy is going to continue in this unit, although it begins to be challenged by the feminist movement. But I would say it's not till unit six that there's something really we could say as a change for that. Trade continues. Religion continues to be diffused. And then I've got the new social classes due to industrialization, the Atlantic revolutions, and the new forms of production and labor for the Industrial Revolution. So now the last unit is roughly 1900 to the present. So a social trend is that after World War II in particular, human rights becomes a universal expectation. And the United Nations has a document called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And after the Holocaust, that became something that it was considered the responsibility of nations around the world to ensure was, was happening for everybody. And we're going to talk in a minute here about economic globalization being the driving force for that something somewhat Western idea, that, was, that Enlightenment idea of human rights. So we have major political uh, global conflicts, of course, World War I, World War II, and the Cold War. Remember for the Cold War, and this map here is kind of showing what those purple would be the U.S. side and green would be the Soviet Union side. The Cold War was cold, and there was no direct confrontation between those two superpowers because of the threat of nuclear weapons. Also during this time period, we have the collapse of major empires. The Ottoman Empire is going to collapse at the end of World War I. The Qing Dynasty collapses right about the same time. And then the Russian Empire, or Soviet Union, would collapse at the end of the Cold War. And the other big political story is the end of imperialism, or the process called decolonization, shown down here on this map, in which Africa and Asian nations that had been controlled by Europe gained their independence in a relatively short time in the 1950s and 60s. So some environmental trends, um, they really, in this unit, have to do with advancements in science and technology. So we have the Green Revolution and medical advances resulting in an increase in population. We have pollution and competition between states due to the scarcity of fossil fuels, such as oil. And then we have the fact that economic productivity and cultural diffusion were stimulated by the internet and phones and other technologies that have made it easier to communicate across great distances. So the big story culturally is the globalization of Western culture. And in many cases that has to do with business connections. It also has to do with individuals migrating for labor reasons. For instance, during the era of imperialism, a lot of intellectuals and elites from European colonies, let's say in Africa or in Asia, migrated to the European country to go to school. Gandhi, for instance, was a British uh, London-trained lawyer. So that's part of the facilitation of that, of that culture. So there are responses to that globalization, and religious fundamentalism is an example of that. And we also had some population resettlements which created religious disputes, or they were caused by religious disputes. So remember when India got its independence from Britain, it split into two countries, primarily Muslim Pakistan and primarily Hindu India. And after World War II, the United Nations had a plan to partition the era, era known as Palestine into a Jewish state that's called Israel and a, an Arab state that is primarily um, an idea. So economic trends, we have globalization, and that's really facilitated by what's called economic liberalism, or a focus on the free market, which means that there are very few, if any, barriers to trade between countries. So the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank made funds available to countries to develop their economies with the caveat that they were not allowed to, to put tariffs up. And so this is why so many things today say made in China. That's an example of globalization. Some regions, like the European Union, made their own trading agreements to try to compete with larger economies. And in some cases, this globalization made com companies like Royal Dutch Shell so rich that they were able to challenge the authority of states. And in some of those developing economies, maybe in Latin America, Africa, or Asia, they were able to dictate terms to countries that they would be abiding by. So now for the continuities and changes for this unit. The well-educated elite classes will continue to hold power, 
For an environmental continuity, we have continuing to rely on fossil fuels, and you know, an industrial economy continues, and the diffusion of religion, and we could kind of bring up the Western character of that due to globalization. And remember, the reason we keep talking about Western culture is because it's West that started industrialization, and so they're kind of the driving force of these economic trends. So the expectations of human rights are a social change. We have a lot of empires that collapse during this time period. In fact, we're kind of living in an era today without empire. Um, that's debatable, but World War II is considered by many to be kind of the end of empire, at least for now. And then globalization and economic li liberalism fueling economic growth, uh, which hopefully is spreading around the world, although you might remember from our studies that there is the growth is not even across the board. So that's the end of the quick overview of the whole course by Spice Theme, focusing on continuities and changes. Happy studying! Mm -hmm.